Hi everyone, I am Sanya Kule and this is Jen Bersler, a biostatistician at the Department of Biostatistics and Medical Informatics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So thank you for taking time today to tell us about yourself, Jen. Hello, yes, I'm a biostatistician. I've been working for about six or so years now, doing all different kinds of medical research and I'd love to talk to you about what I do and some methods that you can use as well. Yay, so thank you. Oh badges! Go badges! Yay! Woo! Yay. <laughs> Yanki and I are very excited to learn about the applications of biostatistics. Jen is going to share her video on statistical analysis for mouse tumor volume. This is an example of the type of work that you can do as a biostatistician, and it will involve a lot of very interesting biostatistical techniques. Yankee, these cute little mice you'll be talking about have been used for science, not just for you to chase and to play with. Mm. Uh, mice are his little uh, best friends in a way. He likes to chase them, play with them and feel kind of powerful around them. So let's give a hand and a round of applause, Yankee, to Jen for sharing her interesting and very meaningful work with us. So a big round of applause to Jen. So I am Sanya Kulu and this is biostatistician Jen Bursler. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about um, stats analysis for mouse tumor volume experiments. And I wasn't familiar with who exactly would be in the audience about the, in this group. So I want to like tell you a little bit about myself if you don't know me already. Um, I have a master's in statistics from UW. Um, I have 75% of my effort with Kyungman Kim. Now, not all of that is with this type of cancer research. Uh, but a fair chunk of it is, and I think these numbers here, the 35% with uh, Zach Morris's PO1 and about 10% with Sandel's lab, those, I, I always think that Kunkman's trying to ask for more and more of my effort on these things, so uh, I think this is maybe what we asked for. It might be 15% with Sandel's lab, but uh, regardless, whenever we check every six months, it seems to be just about right, and uh, always trying to ask for more with this group. Um, so I see myself, uh, mostly as a coder, actually. Um, I program in R daily for about six years now. And even before this, I was a web developer. So I have most of my background is in programming. Um, I see myself more as a coder among statisticians, but I think to the outside world, everyone would just see me as a statistician. I'm also a teacher. I teach a special topics course in this department biostats. Um, one is for intro to R and the other one is publication ready figures. I teach them in the fall. Um, so if you're interested in those courses, let me know and uh, you can take a look at the catalog there. Um, Yeah, and even the publication ready figures, that's in R. So if you're using R, that's probably good to take as a researcher. A lot of my students are uh, definitely researchers more so. Um, and I'm also a transplant, um, I guess in two different ways. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in New York City and then moved to Wisconsin and progressively have moved to more and more rural areas. And I am a living non-directed kidney donor. Um, that fun fact about me isn't necessarily relevant to my knowledge about tumor growth, but I like to share it because I kind of heard about, that's what like sparked me to donate my kidney was just kind of hearing it offhand and it clicked. So that's my fun fact. 
So when I'm talking about tumor growth, I'm talking about data that kind of looks like this. And uh, this is thanks to Amy, Erica, and Mackenzie for working on this project. I'm going to re be referring to this one a lot. Uh, you're probably familiar with this kind of data. You measure the tumor over time, typically um, two dimensions, and you approximate the volume based on a very simple formula. Um, the general design is it's a randomized trial. You randomize the mice. Um, they get separated into the, these different groups, and this is what it looks like. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. You might also be familiar with this. Uh, there's a paper from 1993 uh, that a lot of people look to as comparing these different methods in uh, tumor volume, but it's from 1993, so it's quite outdated, and I'll get into that. Um, so these are the different methods. Uh, you can see analysis methods in the second column that were analyzed in the paper, and this is just their table one, pretty much word for word um, from that paper. And there's issues with each one of these, so, and they acknowledge that too in this paper. Uh, so you can run an ANOVA or kruskal wallis test um, at each time point that you have, uh, and then you stop until you get significance. One issue with this is, well, what if you stop too early? Um, or uh, you definitely have type, uh, inflated type 1 error rate, you know, in clinical trials, we set certain interim points, and this is kind of just like not waiting to open the box, but opening the box at every time point, which gets pretty obvious why that would be an issue. Uh, so volumes at final times, this could be sensitive to, well, are you sure you actually ran the experiment for the correct amount of time? Sometimes we work with these, there it could be 30 days, it could be 90 days, 120 days, maybe even more. Um, and uh, then there's doubling times for with a log rank test. This one doesn't come up very often. Um, I've only seen it a few times. It's not very popular with this lab to look at doubling times. And then entire curve analysis, which is what we mostly do now. However, these methods here uh, from this 1993 paper, um, we don't exactly use these anymore. Uh, so the first two here... Uh, exclude mice with any missing values. So the gold standard in you know these types of experiments we're doing is survival. You want to look at survival before you go over to the tumor volume. That can tell you a lot of important information. Um, so we, we do have a lot of mice who die during the study or they need to be sacrificed because of issues that come up. So these two methods wouldn't work for a lot of the experiments that we do here. And it can be a lot of data lost if you have to exclude the mice who uh, died during the study, which also would be bad because you're excluding important data. Um, these variance assumptions, same variance in all treatment groups, uh, same variance in all groups and at all times, those assumptions are kind of difficult to meet. Um, sometimes we can log transform data and that will help with those assumptions just a little bit. So now for some more modern methods that we use, uh, we use the LME4 package, which was co-authored by Doug Bates, um, and he's at UW-Madison um, every now and then. Colin Longhurst, who also works a lot in uh, tumor mouse models, will like run into him and ask him a bunch of questions about errors that he's been getting in the package. Um, but again, you need to make some assumptions about the data in order to use it, and sometimes it kind of just breaks, you know, there, there's issues that you can run into um, and heterogeneity within a treatment group. So within one group, you might have some mice who completely respond and some non-responders and their tumors just keep growing and growing. Uh, so when that occurs, uh, sometimes these models have a hard, hard time making estimates. And the last one that we're exploring here, but we don't really have uh, much experience with just yet is using uh, Bayesian multi-level models. So here's a little bit about those methods that um, uh, we use now. Um, I'm not going to get so much into them here because I have tons of examples to show that show how these issues break down. And then another uh, tool that I use lately, another method, is time-weighted average, 
which is similar to the first two methods in that 1993 paper. Um, and I'll get into how that time weighted average is calculated at the end of the talk. So again, uh, getting back to this example, uh, when I get a data set like this, there's certain features that I look for. I look for extreme values, um, and in terms of outliers, I don't really call anything an outlier unless we investigate it outside of the data. It's not enough to just say it's large. We need to look at why, why that is the case. I look at were there deaths during the study? What does the variability within a group look like? What does it look like between groups? Is the time equally spaced? Are there uh, zero volume tumors where there were no tumor detected? And I'll often ask what the minimum uh, measurement threshold was. And then so I'm, then I make a, a figure of the mean tumor volume uh, at each time point. And this is another common thing that you see. Sometimes it gets truncated after the first mouse in a group dies. In this case, there were no mice who died. And based on this figure, we can just look at it and make some ideas in our head about uh, which ones would we expect to be greater. You know, so naive mice seem to have the largest tumors, followed by CD4 depleted, NK depleted, and so on. That's just what we would see just from this figure. Now, we didn't do any stats on it yet, so we don't know if those are actually true phenomenon. So, uh, one of the first things that that Heitchin paper from 93 looked at was Kruskal Wallace at each time point. Um, so, if we look at days 18 through 32, these are the results that we get. We get that CD4 depleted is greater than these lower ones, and we get that um, naive mice are greater than those three lower ones as well. And that, that seems like a fine conclusion to make. Uh, but if we actually followed it based on um, how that paper set up the method, we'd, we would stop at day six. We would find significance with the kresko wallace test at day six. And the results we would get are very different from the end of the study. So you might think, well, that's obvious. Why would you stop at day six? Well, how do you know to stop at day 32? I guess you're all experts in this and you know, but why not day 90? So uh, the next step of this um, is looking into LMMs and GLMMs, which are linear mixed effects models and generalized linear mixed effects models. Uh, so for a lot of these, um, you'll commonly see that there's a, a log transformation done. And um, I apologize if a lot of what I'll be going over is like very basic, uh, maybe if it's something you're already familiar with, or maybe just haven't revisited this way in a while. Um, so I kind of view this as like how the model sees it. So the model sees it as, uh, you know, this log transform here. But why do we even do that? Um, so here's a picture of one of the diagnostic plots that I use uh, when I'm analyzing if a model is good. So I took Amy's data, ran it through this linear mixed effects model, and uh, this is the residual plot that I got, residuals versus fitted. So uh, the main reason why we would use transformations and stuff is kind of like to fix this plot, make it look better, and I'll get what that to what that means, and also to replicate what the true data generating process is. So what I mean by that is if we use the untransformed data, it means that for every X days, the tumor grows by Y amount. See, for every X days, the tumor grows by Y amount. For log transformed data, we have a slightly different interpretation of those coefficients. For every X days, the tumors grow by a factor, a multiplier, they have a growth rate of Y. And so we look at the difference of the slopes with the untransformed data, or we look at the difference of the ratios with the log transformed data. And I'm not necessarily an expert in tumors, but perhaps some of you are. <laughs> and it seems to me that this log transformed data is a better approximation to maybe the, the true process for tumor growth would be like the earlier part of a Gompertz curve. So what are the residuals supposed to look like? Well, I refer to it as this perfect potato. You 
want just like a no patterns. You want just like a cloud of residuals there. So no major shapes, edges. You want it approximately centered around zero with, you know, see my residuals go off to like 100 to a negative 100. That's kind of what you want it to look like. So if I look at my picture here, I have a harsh line. You can see that line there um, going across this way. And there's kind of a funnel shape, which means that there's more variability here in the larger values. They're very tight with lower fitted values. Kind of looks like a cornucopia, I think. Um, it's cornucopia shaped. Uh, so typically, if we see this kind of shape, it means it's an excellent candidate for a log transformation. What does that log transformation look like? Well, it's just a mapping from one value to another, and it kind of looks like this. So these larger values up here have less variance at the upper end. You know, you're, you're squishing them together from 500 to 750. You're only moving from about 5.5 to 5.6. Um, and then if we do that, we get a picture that looks like this, which is an improvement. It's about half of a perfect potato, but there's still something going on in the front here. Um, and sometimes that's okay, uh, but these lines that are going across are from different measured volumes that happen. So in this case, 0.5 was a common measured volume. I'm not so sure why that one came up. Uh, and there was another line for a different actual volume, another line for another one. You can kind of see how that works there. Uh, but I have a confession about those residual plots that I was showing you. They actually don't have any zeros in them because this log transformation is not defined uh, for zeros. So simply removing the zeros makes a big difference. Now you get a, a slightly different look of your mean tumor volume. They all kind of go up and one goes up quite drastically which might mean that it has a lot of heterogeneity. Maybe half of the mice are good responders and the other half are not responding. So uh, if we do an imputed value for the zero, so add in a little bit instead of zero. So make it, make it defined somehow. If you add in a little bit, um, it, well, it depends on how much you add. And you can see the smaller and smaller that I, I impute for my zero, if I say instead of a zero, I have 0 0.001, uh, then that can affect my results. I'm pushing this cloud of the non-imputed values up and up. And that can, yeah, it does affect my results, especially because this data set was uh, about 36% were zeros. So how does that actually look? You know, you, you see these plots, but what does that actually mean? So now here's an example uh, from data from Peter Carlson. So thank you, Peter. I don't think he's on this call though. Um, and for this experiment, I just played around with different values for imputing the zeros. So impute them as fours, which I think was, maybe that was the minimum detected threshold. Um, and a few other lower ones. And you can see uh, relative to, you know, the addition of 12 gray, um, my estimates here kept increasing in their variability. But the point estimates were about the same. And you can see if I imputed a very, very small value that it's still significant, but just barely. And for this other case here, uh, looking at with the addition of TRT, my results change. You know, if I remove my zeros, I'm getting a different result. I shouldn't re remove my zeros. And then the smaller and smaller value that I impute for zeros, I can get results from this. That, that's not a good model to me. So an alternative is using a GLMM with a log link. Uh, so what's going on in the back end of these models? Well, log x is undefined when x is zero. And with these models, we're trying to find the expectation, the mean. Um, so instead, let's flip it. Let's find the expectation and then take the log. That's oversimplification of what's happening here. So returning to Amy's data, um, I ran these GLMMs uh, with this new thing that is 
sensitive to a choice of something. So GLMMs are sensitive to the choice of optimizer they use. And that gets more into like, you know, deep computer science type stuff. Uh, so there's Bob YQA, Nelder Mead, um, different types of functions that are used to reduce the amount of error uh, that occur in these models. So over here in this column, I have the expected direction based on means. So the, the color in each cell represents uh, which one the model says is the larger tumor, and the number of stars is the significance. So for the gray, no significant, there is no, the model didn't find any difference. For the ones that show up red like this, that means that the naive mice were the greater one. And so based on the, the uh, means plot that I showed you, I can kind of get an idea of like, oh, I would expect the naive mice to be greater in this case. I'd expect it. I expect the CD8 depleted to be greater in this case. I expect, you know, NK depleted to be greater in this case and, you know, get some kind of idea. That's not the best way of doing stats though, I'm not just looking at a figure. Um, and these are the results I get. And you can see it is sensitive to the choice of optimization function that you use. Uh, typically, Bob YQA tends to be the best, but sometimes it still just doesn't work. And well, why are these giving different results? And uh, how do we know which one to actually get? Well, that's kind of complicated because a lot of these will give errors. And so what if I'm really bent on using a GLMM? I try all these different optimization functions and they all give me errors. Well, some of them will give different types of errors here. Um, they all give this model is nearly unidentifiable rescale variables, which is funny because they are all scaled in this case. And it looks like they're failing to converge because some measurement is out of range of a tolerance. And I can see for Nelder Mead, it's about 0.36 relative to a tolerance of 0.002. And uh, based on this, it looks like, well, if I had to use something, maybe the Nelder Mead would be better to go with than the, this other one, NL opt whatever, uh, because it didn't fail as catastrophically. I guess that's positive. <laughs> uh, and then another thing that we can play around with are the, the random effects of these types of models. So the prior one that I showed you only had a random intercept. Another degree of freedom you can play around with is a random slope. Um, but in this case, these models really did not do well with uh, a random slope. Um, and uh, one way I can tell is because they have very high correlation between their random effects. So then with all these issues, this, you know, imputed values, they work sometimes, they converge. GLMMs, they work sometimes when they do converge. Um, I've been favoring this new method of uh, time-weighted averages. And does this work every time? Um, so far, I haven't had any issues with it. Uh, it's possible that I could have some issues with either being underpowered or having an inflated type one error rate. I still want to explore that, maybe run some simulations or go back on historical data I have. So I first found out about uh, time-weighted averages um, from the news, uh, from one of the Regeneron um, COVID treatments. Uh, they were using time-weighted average to look at the change of viral load over time. Um, and this antibody cocktail uh, was actually the one that President Trump received, or former President Trump rather, received when he was uh, in the hospital for COVID. And he was friends with uh, the company CEO for years. They did, they played golf together. Another interesting unrelated fact to tumors. So how do you calculate this time-weighted average? So here's one mouse that I pulled out. This uh, this was in the IgG group, and the mouse's ID was C, so we'll call him Charlie. This is Charlie's data. And we're going to calculate the area under this curve. Pretty basic. We're gonna, we have some triangles and we have some squares. We're going to use these basic formulas to calculate the area. And then we're going to consider that, well, we have that whole area across 32 days. And then we finally get that 
our average, our time weighted average here is 23.2. So this is a little bit different than just taking a simple average of all these data points because I have differently spaced times. I have, you know, three days space in between here. I have eight days space in between here. So each measurement gets weighted a little bit differently. So then I take that number, throw it off to the side in this orange group here, move to the next mouse. This next mouse has a higher time weighted average of uh, 86.1 keep that number in the blue group, and then kind of continue on. And I'm summarizing each mouse into just one number. And then what do I do with those numbers? Uh, so I run a Kresko wallace test on their time-weighted averages. Um, and in this case, it was significant. So then I moved on to Mann-Whitney tests uh, for pairwise um, testing. And the Crystal Wallace and Man Whitney Wilcoxon test, uh, they're very similar. Uh, the Man Whitney test is a special case of the Kruskal test when there's only two groups. So sometimes you might see that interchangeably or just, you know, kind of like squares and rectangles, just refer to them all as Kruskal Wallace tests. So in this case, these are the results that we got. We got that naive mice are greater than these bottom three groups, and the CD4 mice are greater than these, the same bottom three groups. So then you might have even seen this slide before. Um, they're actually, they're getting the same results as what we found earlier if we just ran Kresko wallace and Mann-Whitney pairwise tests on the last um, several dates of this study, which kind of makes it seem like, you know, that makes sense. Um, and also on this, uh, it, it's, the time weighted average is a little bit less sensitive to these week-to-week -week fluctuations. Um, it doesn't have the major disadvantage of having that inflated type 1 error rate due to the repeat testing, uh, and it considers that whole curve even though it is summarizing it into one number. So now I have a case study about that Alex Piper, and I'm sure he's not working alone, um, but he's got some prolific research here. and. I, I like working with Alex, so this is not a complaint at all. <laughs> uh, so every now and then from Alex, I will get a spreadsheet um, with multiple tabs, uh, and each tab is a different experiment, and there's 14 tabs here. So then I look at my toolkit of the stats methods I have, and there's LMMs, which you know need some fine tuning. There's GLMMs, which I need to run all these different optimization functions, see which ones work. Um, that can be really time consuming. So in this case, I re rely on time-weighted averages and I write scripts to run these in batch. So these are some screen caps of the most recent re batch of reports that I sent to Alex, uh, where we look at the Kresko wallace test. And you can see for this one, we didn't run any pairwise tests for this particular experiment uh, because the Kresko wallace was insignificant but for the survival of a slightly different experiment that was in that package, uh, there was um, differences uh, in survival. So we ran some pairwise ones on that. Uh, and we also go into some drug synergy things, which I'm not going to go so much into this talk. Actually, I'm not gonna go into it at all. And because he's got so many experiments here, I made an index page that would just be a little bit easier uh, to navigate through. Maybe that's uh, calling back to my um, background in web development. Um, and I always like to see how you guys work. So these are some screenshots about how I work. I would love to see more pictures of what it's like in the labs where you are. Um, so I work in R and R Studio, and I write code. And some of these things are, you know, a thousand lines of code, hopefully no more than a thousand, but uh, I wrote one script that iterated over each of these um, tabs in Alex's spreadsheet. And based on some descriptive statistics for that, like how many mice had died, if it was eligible for being a synergy experiment, different output would show on those reports. So now most of my time is not spent you know, fitting models and running models and hand coding everything. Most of my time is spent reviewing the results of the time weighted average and double checking that everything went right. Uh, so I actually want to show you a little bit about what these uh, reports look like. 
So here's an example of what I give to Alex. And I th I've definitely given this to other um, people in the group too. Um, so the data summary, I, I do just to make sure we're on the same page. You know, these are the number of data points you collected. These are the number of mice in each group. Look at the mean volumes, the number at risk of death. So the number goes down once the mice die. Uh, looking at the volume by mouse and volume by treatment average, and you can hover over these. So if a researcher sees like, oh, that point doesn't quite look like what I remember, maybe I misentered it, you could hover over it and see, oh, that's, that's mouse F on day 18. I'm gonna go back into the spreadsheet and double check that that one worked. Um, and then volume by treatment average, you can even hover over those too. Uh, and then here's, sure. Yeah, and so these I'm, I'm making in our studio. I'm sure maybe Prism has something like that. Um, but I, I also like to show these, to again, to make sure that we're on the same page, that what I'm seeing here is the same as what you're seeing uh, on your end. Um, and then for these, here's some results. Here's some drug synergy stuff. Um, and all of this kind of, you know, it, it gets a little bit automatically generated here. Again, we can hover over some things and see what the... Um, time-weighted averages were for the different groups, their medians and ranges. Um, for this one, no pairwise tests were conducted. And that's what I had for that one. Let me see. And yeah, so n the next steps of this are looking into this BRMSR package for Bayesian multi-level models. And I am a skeptic of these. Uh, I can't say that I know much about them. Uh, it re relies on STAN, which is another language outside of R. Um, it can be slow at times, and I have yet to see a mouse tumor model using this BRMS type of model that uh, has found significance. And that even includes uh, projects where we were looking where we you know, ran it with a linear mixed effects model, imputed some small value for the zeros and found differences there, tried running it in these Bayesian models and still found nothing. Uh, so we're getting a discrepancy with these Bayesian models. And that's it for my talk. I wanna thank um, Alex Piper and his team, Peter Carlson and his team, uh, Amy, Erica, McKenzie, and all the people who worked with that data uh, I do want to thank all the mice. There were definitely a lot of uh, mice in these studies um, who have uh, unwillingly uh, given their lives for this research. And I want to thank Colin Longhurst, Trong, Jared, and Nick Zaborik for the discussions about all of these uh, different methods. And that's it for my talk. Yeah, so um, in the LMMs, the GLMMs, and the time-weighted average, those all will take into account um, mice who died before. Uh, it wouldn't be able to weight them any differently than a mouse that was pulled from the study for a different reason. I've seen some designs where, you know, um, half of the mice of a certain group will be sacrificed at a certain time in order to have some measurements taken. Um, so you wouldn't be able to see any difference there. It's not like they're weighted extra special because they had died. Um, but the, the time-weighted average, so that was first 
my first exposure to it was in the uh, reading about the Regeneron um, clinical trial. And they used that because, you know, some people were dying before some of the follow-up visits or some people missed some visits but continued later on. You know, you, you miss your three-month visit, but you come back for your four-month visit. Uh, so the time-weighted average is flexible on that. And so that, that last step of calculating that time-weighted average, you know, like I showed, you take all the area and then you divide by uh, the time that they were in the study. Um, so for all the mice in this study, it was 32. If I only had 18 days, I would be calculating you know, measuring out into 18 days and just divide by that. Um, so that is baked into that. Um, it, for a mouse that kind of, you know, crash and burns, like they, their tumor grows very, very quickly over a short period of time and they die versus a mouse that might have a slower growth, but reach the same amount uh, later. I think those would have the same time weighted average um, so that's a challenge there, uh, but that still does say, you know, they, they both had large tumors at the end of the day, um, even if it took a little bit longer. The uh, LMMs and GLMMs look at that slope, though. So uh, it doesn't, even having like an incomplete curve doesn't matter so much. If that curve is going fast up, uh, it will definitely take that into consideration. So yeah, all, all of these will leverage data from mice who had died. There's no carrying forward of their old data and there's no um, need to exclude any of them. And I will say, again, I think that the survival analysis should be the gold standard. We should definitely be looking at that first and making a lot of inference off of that and then tumor growth as a secondary. If it's ethical to continue the study at that point, I, th I think that would be best. Um, you could imagine a worst case situation where, well, what if one of these mice died at day six? Um, you wouldn't want to end the study. And with these methods, you can definitely leverage the information that comes after that death. Uh, yeah, so it, it uh, they would consider that, um, they would consider like that, you know, if there's a steep slope or even if there's not much of a slope. Uh, so it could be an issue if the mouse's tumor didn't grow very f large, but they still died early. You wouldn't really be able to see the impact of the tumor volume on that. Um, but if the mouse had a very large tumor very early and then died very early, um, you could use, you have a steep slope there. You have, you know, tumors that started at day zero at zero, uh, at zero volume and then went all the way up, I don't know, to like 250 or something at day six. That would be astounding. Um, and we can utilize that slope. We can definitely do that. Yes, and, and that's, that's kind of how the model sees it. I'm, I'm using air quotes here about how the model sees it. These linear mixed effects models and generalized linear mixed effects models, the mixed part includes these random intercepts or random slopes that uh, are per mouse. So it's, the models aren't like looking at the group means, they're taking into consideration the trajectory of each individual mouse.
Yeah, so um, that's kind of tricky. Uh, I don't recall the last time I did a power calculation based on survival. Um, what I do more often, though, is power calculations based on response. Uh, and maybe that's just because a lot of the experiments that I've been getting lately, um, you have a fair amount of mice who have zero volume or undetectable tumors at the study end time. Um, so when, when we do that, we just do a uh, test of proportions. Um, and that's how we power it, is just look at, well, how many would you need for, to be powered at a chi-square test or something. Yeah, so that actually doesn't come into play with these tumor volume models, um, which is definitely a disadvantage. Uh, it's only looking at the tumor size, so you're not you're not penalizing any measurements if the mouse had something else going on. Um, one thing that might be a possibility that I haven't looked into. Uh, a lot of these tests, the Cresco Wallace and Man Whitney tests, they're rank sum, uh, which means that you could put just like a really large value for one and it kind of weights it. It, it. it knows it's large, but it's not sensitive to the number that you pick. So you could just put like um, ones that had some kind of complication that led to death or some kind of severe event. Uh, you could impute like a, you know, 10,000 or something for the time-weighted average, and that would kind of wash out with the Cresco Wallace. But I don't think I would quite recommend that because uh, you're, you're really trying to look at just tumor volume and that those kinds of events don't really speak so much of the tumor volume story. Oh, sorry. Oh, Caitlin Wu? No, I, I don't exclude outliers. If I see things like this, I'll talk to the researcher about it and say like, hey, was this a mismeasurement? Was something else going on here? Um, and But if this is truly what was observed, if that's part of the distribution, if that's part of the ph phenomena that we're getting here, uh, they can definitely stay. Um, it's then just a challenge of getting the model to accurately represent the data generating process. Uh, and even though on this untransformed data that looks quite large, on the log scale it doesn't look nearly as bad. Um, and so with these log transform models, you're it's much easier for those models to handle um, larger outliers like this. Yeah, this type of uh, analysis here that I did with like running all these different models with the convergence, I actually do run all the different convergence ones, but I look at the diagnostics, I don't look at the results. I look at which one had the best convergence, which one had the best performance in terms of those diagnostics. And things like this that I did for uh, Peter's project, this was uh, more so an illustration of the sensitivity to the imputed value. We didn't try and see which one agreed with our hypothesis. Thanks to Jen for taking the time to talk to us about your um, interesting career as well as a biased statistician. Any other questions? Hi there, thank you so much for watching. Hello, thanks for watching this. Hope you like, comment, and subscribe to this video. Thanks. Thank you.
So I hope you create your own sunshine. Yay! And enjoy the sunshine. Yeah, create your own sunshine. And please um, do reach out with any and all questions that you have. I'm Tanya Kuller, and this is Jen Bursler. And we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to watch it. So please do like, subscribe, and reach out with any and all questions. Thank you. Bye. Bye.